Good morning. Thank you, Patrick. Everybody can hear me okay? Great, great. So before we start, actually I have two points before we go into the presentation. One is a disclaimer. So for those of you that will be doing a techno bingo during my speech, I will use terms like new normal. I will use supply chain disruption. Definitely digital transformation, right? The perennial favorite. I might sneak in digital twin, and I'm going to avoid using AI. So we'll see how I do. So that's the one disclaimer. <laughs> A second one is managing expectations, right? We are all technology professionals here, and it is very important for us to really set the, set the stage right. So when Chris McCauley from Axfade reached out to me and said, hey, you know, do you, want, do you mind being a keynote speaker at our event? I had to pause a minute because I had just come from a conference uh, where General David Petraeus was the keynote speaker. You guys may know him, right? Four-star general um, led the international forces in Afghanistan, director of CIA. So during my session, you're not going to hear anecdotes or life-changing decisions around how to avoid nuclear war or you know, sort of go through those challenges. So it will be a sort of a humble, what our journey is humble journey as we go through this. Uh, the sort of the disruptions, as I said, in supply chain and how API, as API logistics, we are, you know, addressing it. So hopefully, you know, I got everybody on the same page so we can kind of move forward. So who is API logistics? You know, some of you may know, may not know us. We're actually, our U.S. headquarters is in Scottsdale. Uh, Global we are based out of Singapore. So we're part of KWE. KWE is a, a Tokyo-based global freight forwarding and logistics organization. So between KW and APL Logistics, we're a little over $7 billion business. APL Logistics focuses on primarily on the solutions and logistics part of it, while KW is uh, primarily focused on the ocean freight and air freight business. And today, you know, among you, we have both our colleagues from KW as well as APL Logistics, and hopefully you'll get the chance to talk to them and learn more about us. But, you know, one of the interesting things is we're globally present, which essentially drives a lot of the work that we do for our customers. Our aspiration is we are today about number 14 in the world, you know, globally in the transportation logistics sector. By 27, we want to be in the top 10. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. You know, we're very excited, you know, partnering with Axway and others to, to get us there. So from an organization perspective, we operate in 60 different countries. And we support primarily our customers, our global multinationals or uh, f global Fortune 500 companies, partly because a lot of the things that API Logistics gets involved in really in the complex supply chain processes. You know, we bring our service expertise as well as our technology to the forefront. How do we do that? Obviously, I'm you know, privileged to be here in front of you today. I represent a, a broad team of API Logistics technology professionals. One of the key tenets of our sort of technology team is, and I, you know, from Paul and Patrick, I've been hearing a lot about the customer success, which is what, you know, sort of the key tenet for Axway. It is very critical for us too, because we, we call it zero distance to customer, because essentially the work that we do is integrated in our customer supply chain, and we need to make it as seamless as possible for them to be successful. Secondly, it's, our job is logistics technology. That's what we focus on. We're not necessarily mastering on other areas. So we've really honed in on our IT people, whether they're in a the field IT, their infrastructure, they understand the domain of the logistics. They understand the terminology, the nomenclature. They understand the critical factor that we play as a role in our customer supply chain, making sure that their operations are not disrupted. And finally, it is a one IT team. And if we work asynchronously, for probably like many of you, our global teams and IT teams are on in 30 plus countries, but primarily Scottsdale, Singapore, and Chennai are sort of our core engineering hubs that build enterprise scale solutions for our customers and our operations. And again, I'm privileged to be here. I've been with API Logistics as four years as a CIO, and uh, you know, we'll share a little bit of the journey that we've been going through. But before we go into that, a little bit of the, the context. Again, I call that new normal, right? I know everybody's tired of hearing this. And supply chain, we were really excited because prior to 2019, nobody really paid much attention to supply chain and logistics, right? It was kind of like, yeah, it's just boring. I mean, it's you know, warehouses and ships and railroad, etc. Of course, we became really forefront in some ways, not a good way, right? Because, because of the disruptions. But the key thing here is, uncertain as the new normal, what I'm, what I'm trying to call out here is, what we're now hearing from our customers 
Yes, supply chain disruption, some of it has been addressed, but the, what's, what's really different this time is the customer's expectations around really around decision making, because everybody now realizes that, okay, whatever we try to do, predict, forecast, what have you, that is really futile. So how, we, how do we have the flexibility to be able to make the decisions that are impacting our business a lot more effectively? And those are some of the conversations that we're having with our customers. You know, we're talking to them about the sort of the physical layout, like sourcing network, the physical network, if you will. We're talking to them about the financials. How do you manage your working capital? How do you manage your inventory levels? How does the scope three greenhouse gas emissions impact their objectives and what they do from a financial obligation perspective? Because these are now real commitments that everybody's making to the street. So they have to really support that. And then finally, from a talent perspective, are they finding the right skill set? whether it's the workers in the warehouses or the truck drivers or the ship operators to the people that have the expertise to bring the supply chains to life. So those are some of the discussions we're having in the world of supply chain industry. Let me just kind of look at it a little bit from a technology side. And I don't know if this picture resonates with many of you, but I would submit that any company that has been around more than probably 15, 20 years have a technology landscape, something similar to this. What I'm trying to say is we made, and this is sort of the evolution of where we started from, right? We made decisions, one good decision at a time. And especially this is true for the supply chain industry because we're so much integrated and baked into our customers' operations. So you have this extreme customization to serve their needs, which then how do you sort of make that a scale? So it has become a, a little bit of a difficulty. In the past, in 80s and 90s, as you all know, we, in, we all invested a lot in ERPs. We made SAP and Oracle really, really rich. But then we ended up with this monolith, which is very difficult to change, very difficult to operate. And talking about the uncertainty, talking about the decision making, it's becoming very difficult now. So now we end up with this sort of this ball has different components, different capabilities spread, and a lot of silos. Now, like any good decisions business, this is an interesting, I, I thought I'd share with you guys. There was a survey done by PwC back in 2022, and they surveyed the supply, chief supply chain officers, not necessarily technology executives, and they found that this is actually stunning in some ways. Four out of five supply chain officers said that the technology investments failed to meet the expectations. Now, I would say that for most of you, this is not a surprise because we're in technology and I tell our customers all the time, if you think that technology as a silver bullet solve your problems, I mean, be my guest, you're gonna spend a lot of money and time trying to get there. What is behind this, right? So partly driven with the supply chain disruptions, partly because nobody wanted to be behind, especially over the last three years, and I see this in the industry, Every week, I think there was a new startup that was building a supply chain solution on using AI or automation, and we are getting valuations and money. Now, things are stabilizing, right? So I think we're getting to a little bit more of a steady state, which is where more logic starts to kind of form up. But the key thing is technology alone is not the solution, right? You have to kind of have the process. People, you know, the old people process technology still works, and I think it's a key factor. So what does that really mean? As consumers, we are so used to today to live in this sort of the left side, right? You know, we're very digital. We expect everything to be really real time and everything is connected. In some ways, we even volunteer our data to be able to get that connectivity so that we can go from one platform to another or one system or one solution to another without any disruption, if you will. But the reality is on the supply chain industry, if you will, and some of you may be there and you know my colleagues will agree, we are still kind of living on this other side, the right-hand side, which is things are still very manual. So if you think about a supply chain from the old ways from factory to your door, you could have 30 plus different participants in that ecosystem. You could have a mom and pop truck driver in uh, Philippines island hopping. So there's activity that's happening. Patrick mentioned Brazil. You'll probably have to have stack of paper going from one state to another. So there is that. And when you look at the global trade, this becomes a very, very, very difficult thing to do. And it's not a single owner. It's very fragmented and so many players. Second thing is we still operate in one way, 
in a batch mode, so things kind of happen overnight and we move mass amount of data because the amount of data is pretty significant to be able to, to get to the, where it needs to go. So it still works in a batch mode. And then it's still siloed. So a lot of these things are sort of stuck in your TMSs, your ERPs, and, and oftentimes any customer, any given customer will be using multiple logistics provider to operate their global supply chain. So this is where the challenge is. But the expectation is here. So how do we get there? I mean, obviously, this is not as easy to solution, right? We have to really kind of think through how do we dis, you know, sort of decipher it. So what's becoming more critical now in the logistics in this is really three key things. One is how do I automate the manual? How do I integrate the disconnected? And how do I bring the data that I have just generated and connected in you know, better insights with that? If you can address all three things, then we're good. So we address all the problems. That's the easy part to say. So how can we do this? APL logistics, we're in the middle of this journey. The way that we approach this is, well, I'm a big believer in leveraging sort of your ecosystem to get to where you want to go, and then really focusing on what you're good at. That's what we try to do. Again, by no means we're at the end of the journey. We're sort of learning as we go. So what we want to focus on as APL logistics is really on data integration and automation. We work with a lot of technology partners and providers like Axway to help us in this journey. They help us on an enterprise scale, bring their best of breed solutions to market. We also work with supply chain technology providers to understand how their, some of their capabilities could help our customers, our operations. And we also work with the startups and early innovators figuring out how some of those things that might be happening can help our customers and then sort of decipher it and demystify it for our customers so that they can actually approach us to get not only their supply chain expertise, but also the technology capability, if you will. In order to achieve this, we kind of looked at it, and this is the methodology that we followed is not uncommon, and many of you probably are in this journey, perhaps even further than us, but it really starts with the business strategy. So you have to have a really line of sight from the business strategy into the IT outcomes that you want to get to. So unless we can clearly define it, that is going to be a really difficult sort of something to quantify and justify. We looked at it from the customer experience journey. So what we wanted to do is we looked at our customer journey and we wanted to identify where we have the friction, the most friction with our customers, you know, when they want to do business with us and how can we start addressing it. So we called it like a beachhead. Let's kind of focus on this. Let's not try to kind of address everything. Let's establish a beachhead. Let's learn and gain some confidence and competence so that we can start to sort of aspire for the bigger, bigger methods. And then we also looked at it when we do the, our modernization, IT modernization, not just approach it as we're going to move to cloud, et cetera, but really figuring out what business value is this driving. Yes, certainly there's reducing the SGNA, indirect cost, those are all good benefits, but how is this helping our growth? How is this helping our cost to serve from an operational perspective? Really having those conversations with our business partners was really key for us to be able to sort of establish buy-in, if you will. Then, like I said, there's multiple ways to do this. What we found, one method that to be successful, again, not really overly complicated, but it's really starting with the sort of the big planning. What we mean by this is, I know many of us do multi-year planning. You have probably three-year rolling plans, you know, both from a business strategy as well as IT perspective. One difference in this case, at least we felt that we were able to do is, and we had a supportive board, from a funding perspective, yes, the funding typically happens on an annual cycle, you know, many companies do, but we actually got sort of a soft approval for our three to five year plan from the board. The reason being is we wanted to avoid the peaks and valleys, right? Because when the times are good, investment comes in, that's great. When times are bad, then you're just seeing this valley. What happens with peaks and valley, it really impacts your decision making and you're shortchanging, right? You're, short, you're doing shortcomings. So, being able to be consistent investment in technology was a critical aspect of it, and we were able to get our board supporting that. The second one is about three, four years ago, because we were really going fast, we wanted to sort of be really close to the customer, we were build, building solutions that fit the customer, but we're not really spending a lot of time looking at the enterprise scale and saying, well, that customer asked for this capability in India. Well, can I use it in Japan? Or what about the one in China? They're using this kind of capability. It sounds similar. How do we do this? Now, again, for some of the organizations that are mature, this is a very common practice. So we had to kind of pull back and say, how do we work as an enterprise and bring in some new talent that has that expertise? And finally, 
execution part of it is really small, really with small and quick iterations. One of the, at least, decision factors that we, we try to do, and again, this is a struggle that we work on it every day, if any business outcome takes more than three months to do, we pause and say, let's just see if that actually makes sense. Let's see if we can make it even smaller. Because at the end of the day, and coming into this job, and you know, the little bit of our legacy was, we were doing this big 18, 24 month project, and at the end of the day, as you guys know the answer, right? The expectations, you never meet the expectations. You do all this 18, 24 months thing, and business expects this, and actually business already moved on, and you deliver X, and they expect Y. So we felt that anything that is gonna take more than three months, let's not do it. Let's try to get it to that minimum viable product that makes sense. And we were, it, I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. Like, for my business perspective, they say, no, no, I gotta have everything. No, I gotta, if I don't have it, I can't operate. So that requires a little bit of a changing, the operating model as well, not just on the IT side, on the business. So those are some of the things that we were able to do. Now, and then finally, bringing an organization, the organizational model has to be there too, right? You have to have the, not only, it's not about just the talent, the right skill set and right people, but you, you design the organization with the right skill set of people. In our case, we actually brought in um, <clears throat> about, uh, I wanna say 20 to 25 people that were part of business into our technology organization. We created this hybrid environment where they can actually work on products jointly. So again, this was a little bit of a new thing for us. I know some of the organizations are probably a little bit ahead of the game, but you know, we felt that these are the sort of the key tenets that we needed to have in place to, to get to what we wanted to do. So if I can summarize it, and it's uh, uh, Hakan's six step, if you want to call it that way. I mean, you, know, you, you can use it, there's no IP in this. Simple, right? Build a vision and strategy, and then establish an enterprise architecture discipline and a product management discipline. This was a really critical factor for us because you need to be able to have this outlook around when we do a product, both from a commercial and technology perspective, what is the PL, what is the business outcome that we're trying to reach, and then how do we architect it? It has to all come together. When we do IT modernization, we have to do it with a business value. There has to be something for the business at the end of it. And it can't be just IT for IT's sake, right? So we have to really think through how we get there. And then the fourth element is really destroying these data silos. I mean, one of the most important things for, and this is a little bit overused term, but data is the new gold, right? For supply chain industry and logistics, that's why we operate. We are an asset light provider. So the data about where your shipment is, what's happening, what are the exceptions, is very critical. To be able to break down the silos and make that information available to our operators, our people, to be able to make decisions, work with our customers, was critical. And then finally, you can't, break the monoliths in one day. So you have to determine that's been used like choking the mainframe or decoupling some of the components. So having a platform like what Axfay provides is critical in this success. So last one is rinse and repeat. Do the same thing over and again in an iterations, right? It's not a big one big project. It is multiple small projects with an end goal in mind trying to get there. So how did this whole kind of manifest at APL Logistics? I know this, uh, this next slide is a little bit of a I chart, but this is something we actually use with our customers and our executives. And it helps us to explain what the technology landscape at APL Logistics is. And it's really very simple. The bottom layer is what we call operating systems, your traditional systems of record. Those are hard to change. Sometimes it's, you know, yeah, maybe the data. Now in our case, because we are a logistics company, in many cases, our customers have a lot of operating. They have invested in that part of technology. In some cases, they haven't. So they have a choice to use ours. They can use theirs. On the top layer, what we call is the customer experience layer. In the past, we were struggling because of the limitation of the operating systems to be able to offer flexible customer experiences depending on what they needed, what our customers needed, what our operations needed. So we decoupled that. Because technology is pervasive, right? So we are giving our business partners capability with low-code, no-code platforms. Go build your app. But that app has like a very low-end, not high technical debt because that's a consumable front-end that you can throw it away and just build a new one. That doesn't cost us a lot of money because the money is really on the operating systems. So to differentiate ourselves from the others, what we said is, okay, we are going to build this layer, what we call our data integration hub, and it's really investing and putting our resources and time and money on getting sort of mastering that, understanding our data. How can we best, because as a 3PL, our biggest success comes from our ability to shake hands with other providers. So in any, any given scenario, our customers will have hundreds of carriers, 
they'll have suppliers, their factories, their customers. As a logistics provider, if I can connect the dots faster, more effectively for them, that actually means revenue for us. It also means revenue for our customers. So it's really what we are trying to get to. And having a platform like what X-Ray helps us, having that platform helps us to get there. You know, using B2BI, we're using also the API platform. So I think Patrick kind of talked through this. I've been with API Logistics about four years. So X-Ray relationship looks like almost your, throughout your existence in the U.S. You know, we've been with uh, X-Ray as well, almost 18 years, going back to 2005. And interesting enough, we all kind of grew up in the Scottsdale area as well. So it's, it's nice to see, but you know, we've been very, very, uh, very excited about the partnership and the, the working relationship with the Axway team. And then you know, we're looking forward, how can we sort of continue this journey? As I said, you know, the work is not done. We're gonna continue to couple this and create value for our customers. So what is that manifesting in itself? What we call our APL logistics data and integration hub is to say, we can ingest data from any source. It could be our customers, their suppliers, third party resources. And then as an outcome, we want to be able to drive planning, we want to be able to drive visibility, and we want to drive execution. If we can achieve that, that's really what we set out to do. So for our business, what does that mean? So we operate as a sort of a control tower in a supply chain. We provide this end-to-end -end view for our customers, and we orchestrate their movement and flow of their finished goods, their raw material across in the right time, at the right cost, and at the right sort of a, hopefully the lowest emissions level that's possible. Because it is critical for many of us, as well as our customers, have committed to net zero goals. And that's not gonna be achieved just simply tackling what we call scope one and scope two, which is typically what you control, the emissions you control within a physical facility. Scope three really speaks to the, this, like the transportation leg, if you will, of your product. It's a complicated one to tackle. So what we were able to do with these uh, sort of the architecture, we are able to offer our customers so actually award-winning solutions in making decisions based on uh, cost, based on emissions, based on cap capacity, to be able to make those decisions even more further up. So what they want to do, what they get out of this is, instead of building a bunch of product and then sitting in their warehouses, really driving based on the demand, based on the need, they're able to make production decisions a lot more effective and more upstream using some of these technologies that we were able to provide. And that essentially creates a competitive edge for APL logistics. And finally, we are all doing this obviously for our customer value creation. There's financial benefits for them, right? You know, they work in capital, making sure that we reduce that, their operating costs. Typically for any given industry, transportation logistics is probably one of the significant cost elements and they have less control of it. So that's why they rely on companies like us to help them Second one is their operational efficiency. Again, looking at their emissions, looking at their product lead times, how can they get the right product in the right place, you know, and then sort of execute their operations. Many of our customers are in the industrial, textile, apparel, automotive industry, which requires that sort of a sophistication and execution. But finally, at the end of the day, just like what we're trying to do for our customers, what they're trying to do is really improve customer experience for their own customers, and that's really the ultimate goal. So finally, I guess if I can summarize, you know, what the journey that we went through, again, and still continue on, it really boils down to the people part, right? You have to have the good executive support. You have a board that supports and then buys into the vision and supporting it. You have to have the talent in the team, not only the IT, but also the business talent that can actually uh, deliver these results, which you know, I'm privileged to have uh, that at APL Logistics. And then finally, partners like Axway that can come along with your journey. I do like how Paul and Patrick kind of set this up as a, as a community. I know it's overused sometimes, but it is very true because nobody can do all this alone and there is a lot of expertise and knowledge that are available with our technology partners. And you know, I'm very happy to be able to share our journey today. And hopefully, you know, if there are any questions later on throughout the day, uh, me and my team will be able to answer that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.